Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining day four of our symposium on COVID-19 vaccines, Unfinished Business. Today, our topic will be trust in science, influencers and funding, the social, social psychology of vaccine resistance. Our moderator for today will be Dr. Susan Rosenthal. Dr. Rosenthal is a tenured professor of medical psychology and pediatrics and psychiatry and vice chair of the faculty development within the Department of Pediatrics at Columbia University Medical Center. Her clinical research focuses on sexual health and vaccine acceptability. It's my pleasure to turn over to Dr. Rosenthal to begin this session. Welcome everybody. It's um, great to have you here. Um, we're gonna talk today, as Harlow said, about trust in science, and we're gonna focus on two issues that have been pivotal. Um, in terms of how countries have managed their, um, the pandemic. Um, first, we're gonna talk about level of trust um, citizens have had in um, each other, in government, in, in the science community, and then the politics and governance um, of the pandemic response. We are fortunate, we're gonna start today with um, five panelists and then a discussion, and we're fortunate to have representation from Africa, Brazil, Israel and the US, and later um, we'll hear from Greece as well. So we're gonna start um, with Dr. Wilmot James. Dr. James is a senior research scholar at the Institute for Social and Economic Research and Policy at Columbia University. He was a member of parliament and opposition spokesman on health in South Africa. His research interests include global health security, particularly on the welfare of children. And today he's gonna review the role of trust and mistrust in vaccines and their delivery systems in Africa. So welcome, Dr. James. So thank you very much uh, to Dr. Rosenthal, um, uh, Susan, uh, and to a good day to everybody. So I'm gonna deal with trust and doubt in vaccines in Africa and uh, the role of politicians and public representatives in driving vaccine take up. So what have you learned uh, over the last few days of the symposium? The first thing we learned is that between 15 to 20 percent of Africa's population has been vaccinated for COVID-19. Uh, if you look at the full protocol vaccination, it's 15 percent. And if you add the additional 5 percent or so, uh, you have a picture of how low it is. Uh, the Africa Center for Disease Control and the World Health Organization's target um, that they've set uh, for the world to reach is 70 percent by December of 2022. That's in nine months time. Uh, there's a debate about whether that blunt target makes sense, whether we should first focus on healthcare workers, uh, focus on vulnerable populations. Um, there's a concern about capacity and so on, but that's what the target is presently. Africa is the only continent uh, other than Asia to have significantly increased rates vaccination rates recently, it's grown from by 15% between January and February of this year. But the scale of that increase has to be significantly higher to reach that target. And that's in the context where most countries are at peace, but there are some at war, where you have a high level of political instability and at least 15 uh, um, 
um, zones uh, on the African continent. So there are three buckets of constraints that have to be remedied. The first is an ongoing unsolved supply problem. The second is the issue of having fragmented vaccine platforms and here dealing for, with the first time uh, with adults. The only prior experience with adult vaccinations in Africa is with Ebola, and it's restricted largely to the DRC. Um, the point is that the platforms we've inherited are essentially pediatric, not adult directed. And three, to have people actually turn up to be vaccinated at this stage of the pandemic. So the challenge, uh, colleagues, is how to overcome these constraints and what are the role of public representatives in upscaling vaccination rates? And just finally on this question, there are trust and doubt issues associated with each one of these constraints and they are interconnected. Low supply delivered on fragmented platforms and the word gets around, people don't turn up to be vaccinated. So trust and doubt are not just vaccine take up issues, they're not just hesitancy issues, important as it is, it runs across the spectrum of what's required to actually vaccinate people. So what about trust and doubt in vaccines in Africa? African populations are very well disposed towards vaccinations, but this is obviously very uneven across a vast continent consisting of 55 countries and two disputed territories. On average, 11 to 23% of Africans can be considered to be vaccine doubters. People have doubt in vaccines. Africa has a positive history uh, in terms of vaccination experience. Nigeria eliminated polio. Rwanda vaccinated 93% of young women and girls against HPV. The DRC, the Democratic Republic of the Congo, had a successful Ebola vaccination program. Malawi just launched wild polio virus type one vaccination program, uh, programs that will extend to five Southern African countries covering 23 million people. The question is, what have we done with such a pro-vaccine high trust population? Many factors erode trust. Leaders who spread disinformation erodes trust. Politicians who cannot rise above petty partisan issues to serve the public good in pandemic response erodes, erodes trust. Top-down technocratic interventions led by elevated public health experts who do things to people without consultation erodes trust. Corruption diverts public resources from public response and it erodes trust. Broken vaccine delivery platforms erode trust. Waiting for vaccines to arrive late or not at all erodes trust. We asked 11 to 23% of the vaccine doubters to give their top reasons for why they are hesitating. The highest number, 31% said, they did, simply did not know enough about the vaccine to make a decision. They were not anti-vaxxers at all. What they wanted is more information about the safety levels. 22% believe they were not at risk. These are the invulnerable types. 18% suggested that vaccines will give them COVID-19. 14% said that vaccine approval was rushed uh, and 12% denied that the virus existed. So the next theme obviously is the role of public representatives upscaling trust in vaccines. First, it is to visibly take vaccines, which sets a great example and encourages others. This is what the King uh, of Morocco did. The current president of Tanzania, Samia Suru, so Hulu did that, and she reversed the anti-vaccination position of the previous uh, president who unfortunately died. Uh, the president of South Africa, Sarah Ramaphosa, um, also takes responsibility for setting an example. You don't leave it to ministers to do. This is a pandemic and an epidemic, and what's required is that the first office of the land has to take responsibility. You can't kick it down to ministries. Second, there has to be assurance given that vaccines are safe, which really means that you have to ensure that there's a robust drug and medicines approval system in place, that there's a safety monitoring system in place, and that there's a pharmacovigilance system in place. And this is the result of long-term investment. You can't just do it overnight. 
Um, if you look at the Global Health Security Index, six out of 54 African countries stand up well when it comes to measures of the capability and sophistication of your medicines and drug regulatory environment. Cooperation between political parties and spheres and government must happen on the basis of core agreed upon national, a core agreed upon national plan uh, in the national interest facing a common class leveling uh, existential threat. All political parties must agree that there's a core basis for cooperating in the national interest. And you can have fights about what the policies are in term, on the margins, but you have to agree uh, so that there is a common plan for how a country deals with it. Parties can do that, they can take out the responsibility. We've seen in the US that the Republican Party has not done that, uh, but every country has a responsibility to do that. A president or prime minister must take national responsibility and cannot delegate downwards. Parliamentarians must robustly exercise their constitutional powers to hold the executive arms of government to account for their pandemic performance, to rapidly amend or pass bespoke pandemic laws and to secure budgets to improve performance and to invest in future preparedness. And you have to communicate the risk. Public representatives must communicate the risk to their constituencies and they must beseech, they must educate, they must persuade citizens to conform to common sense public health norms, including taking vaccines. There has to be the smart use of the law to compel governments to act in the best public health interest of the nation or the country's population. We must remember the reason why uh, pandemics, uh, in fact, came to an end. Uh, the anti, uh, the HIV uh, rollout of antiretrovirus came to, to an end was a, not a political decision, but a judicial decision in South Africa. And finally, civil society leaders and the media must keep the heat and the pressure up. I always say with members of parliament, you have to keep their seat warm at all times. And so there has to be persistent advocacy and persistent reporting on the issue. Um, then it's the question of what happens in the future, but I leave that for the discussion. Uh, back to you, Susan. Sorry about that. Um, that was great. And that was really gave us a lot of, or at least me at least, a lot of food for thought about thinking about the African context. We're now going to move to Dr. Pasternak, who's going to, who is the associate researcher at the San Paulo, at in at the University at San Paulo at the Vaccine Development Laboratory and a guest professor at the Getulio Vargas Foundation at the School of Public Administration. But we're lucky right now that she's currently a visiting professor in the Department of Science and Society here at Columbia, so we feel very fortunate. She founded a Brazilian NGO focused on science-based public policy, so we're very excited to hear her talk about the impact of the anti-vaxxer movement on immunization campaigns in Brazil. So welcome and I turn it over to you. Thank you, Susan. And thank you, Wilmot, for the wonderful presentation. I'm going to use slides, but it's just the feel and I hope you won't get too bored with them. I promise they're good slides. Just let me know if you can see my screen. Yes, okay. So, uh, Talking about anti-vax sentiment in Brazil, up to now, if you ask me this question like five years ago, I would definitely say to you, there is no anti-vax sentiment in Brazil. Brazil is widely known for its immunization campaigns and an excellent national immunization program. We are the country of vaccines. We vaccinate over 90% of the population, adult and children. We have no anti-vax in Brazil. We have no exigency in Brazil. And so people ask me usually, what, what does it happen in Brazil? Are Brazilians immune to vaccine disinformation and misinformation? Well, we used to be, but that can change. And this is what I want to share with you, show you today. We've been investing in building trust in vaccination programs over the past 50 years. Our national immunization program began in the 70s during the dictatorship. 
And since the dictatorship, we have been building publicity campaigns, bringing people to the vaccination centers and making vaccination a part of a Brazilian's daily life. So Brazilians don't really question vaccines, they get vaccines. Brazilians wake up in the morning, they take the bus, they go to their jobs, they go to school and they get vaccinated. It, it's just as it is. So we never really question vaccines and we are very, very proud that we are able to cater vaccination to over 200 million people in a public healthcare system. These publicity campaigns that draw people to vaccination programs usually involve actors, celebrities, community leaders, Leaders, religious leaders, politicians. So over the past 50 years, we have been investing heavily in talking to the public and to public community leaders about vaccination and how vaccines are safe and how vaccines are important and reminding people when it's time to take their children to the vaccination centers and it worked. Brazil has or had the highest, one of the highest vaccination rates in the world, even for adult vaccines like the flu. So this was the situation in my country until this happened to my country. After President Jair Bolsonaro was elected, we were faced with the situation of having the first anti-vax Brazilian president. This is unprecedented in Brazilian history. We never had a president in Brazil speaking openly against vaccination. President Bolsonaro said that vaccines are going to turn you into an alligator. Vaccines are going to give you AIDS. Vaccines are not safe. Vaccines are not necessary and come on, COVID is just a minor flu. You don't need vaccines. Why are you nagging me to buy vaccines for Brazil? We don't need them, we have chloroquine. And this is what he said in his UN speech. It was a speech for the promotion of hydroxychloroquine at the United Nations. Thankfully, most Brazilians don't really take the president seriously. And when he says that, Vaccines are going to turn you into an alligator. This is how we get dressed to get our COVID shots. But when it's not just the president spreading disinformation, when it's the health minister saying, parents, don't vaccinate your children because COVID pediatric vaccines aren't safe. The health minister said that on national television. He urged mothers and fathers not to vaccinate their children because vaccines aren't safe. We don't know enough about these COVID vaccines. And actually, children don't really get that sick, so don't vaccinate your children. So it's not just the president saying stupid things like vaccines turn you into an alligator, it's the health minister. And the health minister is a doctor. And we have a lot of doctors in our medical community that start echoing the health minister and telling parents not to vaccinate their children. How can we build trust when suddenly the pediatrician is telling parents not to vaccinate their children? People usually trust their doctors. Parents usually trust their pediatrician. And well, in a normal country, people usually trust the health minister. So building trust, not so easy after all. And the impact of the health minister talk was having less than 50% of our children vaccinated for COVID in Brazil. This is not Brazil standards. This is too low for Brazilian standards we usually have 90% vaccination rates for pediatric vaccines. Every one of the pediatric vaccines in the calendar, not only COVID. So, and now we're struggling to get our children vaccinated. Parents are starting to doubt what they never doubted before for any other vaccine. So this is what disinformation spread by the authorities, disinformation spread by government can do to our beautiful trust that took us 50 years to build.
and not only for COVID vaccines, but for the past years, all vaccines, vac uh, all vaccination rates have been dropping in Brazil, much more so in the past two years. And suddenly, our polio vaccination rate that was above 90% dropped to 68%. 68% is not acceptable for the country of vaccines. It's not acceptable for Brazil. The take home message here is that trust in science is very fragile. Trust is not the same as understanding science and trust needs booster shots if we really need people to be immunized against misinformation and disinformation. It's an ongoing process. It's not a finished business. You have to invest permanently and perennially in publicity campaigns. You have to invest permanently in science communication, building trust, but also building understanding and having a stronger foundation for people to refer to when they start to doubt, because suddenly the government is speaking against vaccinations. Thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> Sorry. Thank you very much for that talk. It was um, a little terrifying, but in New York City, um, the popular place for children to get vaccinated was under the blue whale in the Natural History Museum. So I'm thinking you could show up in your alligator costume and get your vaccine under the blue wall, uh, under the blue whale. So we're going to move to um, Dr. Firestein, who is um, the former chair of Columbia University's Department of Biological Sciences, and his research um, interests have focused on the question of how do I smell. And his laboratory studies include the vertebrae olfactory system, which is possibly the best chemical uh, detector. But today, he's going to talk about, he's going to reflect on the public understanding of science and credibility of scientists in the US. I think you'll find that the US has many of the same problems as Brazil. <laughs> so I turn it over to you. Thank you very much. A pleasure to be here. And uh, hello to everybody online with us. I am actually today at the Santa Fe Institute in Santa Fe, New Mexico, in their library, which I wish was my library behind me, but I can't take credit for that. Um, the Santa Fe Institute is a center for the study of complexity. And in keeping with that spirit, I would like to discuss today how we should stop simplifying things and instead embrace the complexity that is the true nature of the world and in particular of this pandemic. Um, I, just momentarily would like to recommend this book, which is a little thick, but don't let that be daunting to you. It's called, um, it's called The Complex Alternative, Complexity Scientists on the COVID-19 Pandemic. It's a compendium of the studies done here at SFI by their scientists using complexity models to understand everything unexpected about COVID-19 and the world's response to it. It is not full of equations or a lot of math. It's intended to be for uh, general public consumption. So I recommend it very highly. There's also an ebook version if this looks a little too heavy for you. So it may be difficult to come to terms with the fact that an organism as apparently simple as a virus can trigger such a complex cascade of events in medicine and healthcare, the social interaction, business and economics, work, family, transportation, education. I mean, is there anything that this virus has left untouched? The simplicity of the virus as an organism, however, is in fact no indication of the complexity of its effects on our global systems. I'd like to suggest that the root cause of this overwhelming upheaval was the desire by the public to get and by scientists and politicians to give a simple answer, explanation, or directive. But there was none. What we were unprepared for was not virulence or transmission or symptomology. What we were unprepared for was uncertainty and complexity. How can we better prepare for that than in the future? On the one hand, the natural sciences, for example, physics, chemistry, geology, have made remarkable progress by simplifying complicated seeming stuff like gravity, matter, uh, motion, chemical reactions with a few fundamental equations and laws. 
But biology and the human sciences in particular will not be tamed by simplification. They are irreducibly complex and perhaps counterintuitively becoming more so. I think we must come to terms with uncertainty and randomness as fundamental features of those parts of the world that we care most about, the parts that we live in. Many scientists, not all, but many have made remarkable progress by embracing and harnessing uncertainty and complexity rather than shrinking from them. But the population as a whole, I fear, remains mostly in the dark when it comes to scientific uncertainty. Our education system is mired in the 19th century. We continue to teach a deterministic view of science in which the exam has right and wrong answers, and there's only one correct choice in a multiple choice question, which we all know hardly mirrors real life. This is not how science goes. It really never did. It certainly no longer does. So can we blame the mistrust of a non-professional populist whose last interaction with science was just such an encounter when the scientific establishment now presents them with possible probabilities and unknowns, or worse, fearful of doing that, presents them with false and overly simple solutions. <clears throat> and I should point out, it's not just science education that is problematic. Our curriculum is filled with unsupported simplifications. We teach history as if the world has unfolded in a smooth set of events that were, if not entirely predictable, can now be easily comprehended as inevitable. This is a mythology. History is full of world altering events that could not have been predicted, no matter how sensible we make it look from our current vantage point. Let me give a very short example from evolution, a kind of history that I'm a little more familiar with as a biologist. Humans and chimpanzees shared a common ancestor some 60 million years ago. This creature no longer exists, but we know a great deal about it from the fossil record from genetics. However, if we could place ourselves at that point 60 million years ago, looking at this then current species, neither we nor anyone could ever have predicted that 60 million years later, there would be chimpanzees and humans. There were a nearly limitless number of possible ways it could have gone, including extinction, in which case we would be talking about it here today. We are very seriously when we mistake retrospective comprehension for current predictability. And so we set up false narratives in which we hope to learn from our mistakes. When what I believe we have to learn is how to make mistakes and how to make them in ways that are non-catastrophic as often as possible. Unless embracing uncertainty and randomness sound depressing and anxiety producing, I'd like to further suggest that it's actually a highly optimistic perspective is one of possibilities rather than determined outcomes. Yes, not all of them will turn out well, but has any so-called planned society turned out so well? The important thing is for us to learn that along with the hubris required to manage existing in this world as well as we do, we must also have the humility to recognize that it is a task full of probabilities and perhaps more importantly, improbabilities. I'll end here with an image I'm borrowing from Emma Cocker, an artist and writer in the UK, who has a wonderful book of deeply perceptive af aphorisms called The Yes of the No. She speaks of the helmsman harnessing the unpredictable forces of wind and water to nonetheless steer a ship. A remarkable feat that most often winds up successful rather than catastrophic. I believe we need to begin teaching the skills of the helmsman and not of the watchmaker who tends to a regular, dependable mechanism that is no longer an accurate model for our real world. Thank you. Thank you very much for that and for explaining how I could stop being envious of your amazing library. I was wondering how you could have such an incredible library. Um, we're going to move on. And one of the good things that came out of COVID was our ability to teleportate anywhere we want to go. So we are now headed off to Israel, where we are very fortunate to have Dr. Alroy Prius um, be with us. She is the head of the public health services for the Israeli Health Ministry. She was previously the deputy CEO of the Caramel Medical Center in Israel and the state epidemiologist in New Hampshire. Um, she is an expert in internal medicine, public health, and infectious diseases. And she's going to talk to us about factors that influence vaccination uptake and compliance with public health mandates in Israel. So welcome. Thank you so much. Um, 
I will also share a few slides to try to show quickly what has been happening in Israel. I hope you can see my slides. Um, so I'm trying to show this as a pro and con uh, kind of a thing, the thing that helped us and the thing that interfered. Uh, so first of all, knowledge is power. We started our vaccination campaign with a lot with webinars to physicians, uh, with information to the um, to the public. It was um, pretty challenging at the beginning. A new vaccine. We were the first country to introduce it broadly, um, and so we had no other country to look around and say, "Here, it's going very well." In that country uh, but the knowledge was in incredibly important to uh to build that trust then the transparency uh to make sure that we follow adverse events we are showing uh um, daily numbers of people who are with confirmed infections hospitalized uh, and making sure that all the data is available um, in our website and try to be as transparent as possible. I think there's still even better way to go, um, or um, we can improve even on that. Uh, but that was part of uh, the criteria that we wanted to, uh, to do it. Um, the other thing was teamwork. In Israel, we have a Ministry of Health that is a pretty strong regulator and four uh, health maintenance organizations, HMOs, and everyone pulled in very quickly with our hospitals uh, to make sure that we do the rollout of the vaccination campaign fast. And within about a couple of months, we were able to uh, vaccinate nearly 90% of our population at risk. And then all in all, about 65% of the whole uh, eligible population. And that was uh, part um, done by the system that works together very well on a day-to-day -day healthcare delivery um, issues. And during uh, this time of pandemic uh, pulled in. Accessibility was one important challenge for us. We have uh, places that are uh, really remote and we realize that it's not going to be helpful if we'll just have centers of vaccinations in kind of center uh, places. We need to make sure that we get to all the parts um, even remotely with a car, uh, with an ambulance, um, and really get to uh, everywhere and make sure that the vaccines are accessible to everyone. Um, another thing that was helpful is that we started our vaccination campaign while we were at a surge uh, of cases and um, we were in a lockdown and we were trying to open up economy uh, part by part, and one way to do it was to introduce um, the Green Pass in Israel, the Green Passport. That meant that if you're vaccinated, you can show it, and if you're either vaccinated or you're doing tests, you can go into places. And I, it was not meant to be uh, to encourage people to vaccinate. It was um, actually meant as a, as a tool for us in order to open places with high uh, crowds, many people in one place, and make sure that those conditions are as safe as possible for the people uh, there when we still have thousands of confirmed infections daily. Uh, but obviously, when you either need to show your vaccination passport or be tested, it's, a, uh, it's an influence for vaccinations. Trust. A big issue. I said pro and con because I think it changes changed along the way. I think it started with the uh, with with um, with trust of the government, with trust of uh, the suggestions by the Ministry of Health. Thankfully, it was not as bad as was described in Brazil. Um, our health uh, authorities and our politicians mostly encouraged um, vaccinations. But I have to say, even in Israel, there are several politicians that made some remarks, not, not as, um, as uh, bluntly as in Brazil, but some remarks that maybe it's a crime to vaccinate in schools um, and things like that. We have a very elaborate vaccination camp um, campaign, routine vaccination campaigns in schools. And so when parents hear that maybe it's a crime 
for COVID-19 vaccines to enter school. That seems like something is wrong with the COVID-19 vaccine specifically because other vaccinations are in school. Um, so I think the trust issue changed along the way and the trust uh, in the government and the policymakers and the decisions that they're making and why are they actually making those decisions? I have to say that with the Ministry of Health, there was a lot of transparency. As I said before, all our protocols are on the website, all the data is accessible. However, the part of the policymakers of the, of the government uh, is sealed. All the protocols is sealed for 30 years. And there were some questions, and there are still some questions, why are they sealed for 30 years? And a lot of demand from the public to open up those protocols. Um, so the trust issue changed along the way. Personal examples, it's a pro and con. We had examples of good uh, politicians and, and, and others, uh, leading figures who are doing things by the guidelines, but also um, not, not a few, more than a few who didn't. And every time uh, a minister or the president or the prime minister is doing something against the guidelines, um, people are asking themselves, why do they need to be in the lockdown or to put a mask or anything else that the Ministry of Health is telling them to do if the people uh, who are high up the ladder are not doing the same thing. Um, another thing that we, ch we changed along the way in the beginning, it was con and I think we improved it a bit, uh, was the understanding that one size does not fit all. We have to figure out why people are not getting vaccinated. We have very different population in Israel, uh, Jews, Arabs, Orthodox, uh, uh, religious uh, groups, and we need to figure out what is concerning to them or why are they not getting vaccines. And sometimes it's like I said before, accessibility issues and that's all. Sometimes it's really more than that. It's uh, fears from fertility issues and others that we need to understand and make sure that we address whether by uh, our um, our explanations to, to that particular public or by getting to their physicians and, and leading figures in their uh, community to make sure uh, that we get the right message out. Public participation is one thing that I think we could have made we could have done better. Uh, we tried to do it one uh, in one occasion when we were we have an advisory group uh, that advises the Ministry of Health on vaccinations and most of their uh, meetings are uh, closed. The protocols are completely transparent, including who said what at the meeting, but it's not videotaped. And um, people showed us the example of the FDA and say, here, you know, public can participate in the meetings. And we try to do the same thing when we introduce the, um, the kids' vaccinations. Um, it was very, very difficult. And I think we need to. Um, figure out how to do public participation, not just uh, transparency, but actually asking them uh, to join in the process as much as possible, even though it's a very um, scientific or um, it, 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 it's a, you can't just go in from the public and speak. So there, we need to, fig to find the balance uh, in order for the public uh, to participate truly. Obviously, social media and fake news have been horrible in Israel. Uh, I think this is part of what broke the trust um, when it started to be more and more um, prominent. We actually had people who are from the medical uh, community who are joining in this uh, fake news spread. And that has been a real challenge because the public sees a doctor or a professor um, and they, and this is confusing. There is one doctor saying that and then another doctor saying that, who should I believe? And when they're asking questions, for example, on fertility, on stillbirth, just a question, does the vaccine cause a stillbirth? We all know it doesn't, but even the raise of the question causes pregnant women to be scared because they're not going to now look for uh, look for the evidence. If there is any ha any uh, concerns, they're not going to take the vaccines. So that was uh, extremely difficult dealing with the social uh, media spread of fake news. 
And the last thing that we are seeing now is public fatigue. We are here in this pandemic for two years now. Uh, Israel has gone through first, second, third, fourth vaccine dose. Uh, and the public is, is just tired. The public, the politicians, um, everyone wants the uh, COVID-19 to be behind us, but it's not. And so we are finding it very difficult now uh, to try to, to, um, to make sure that the notion of living with COVID has some sort of meaning because many times living with COVID for many people means just ignore it. And we can't ignore a pandemic with a virus that constantly mutating. So we need to figure out how to do that better. Uh, but um, part of it is just making sure that the public is with us and it's very difficult after two years. Thank you. And we'll be probably answering questions after. Thanks, that was um, really great. And I think we're hearing that it was a challenge in all countries um, and that nobody really has all the answers yet. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Kraus. Dr. Kraus is the former deputy director of the FDA Office of Vaccines and Chair of WHO Research and De Development Blueprint Expert Committee on COVID-19 Vaccines. He facilitated the approvals of all vaccines that became available in the US over the past 10 years. And he's gonna to speak to us about trust and doubt in regulatory systems um, and give his reflections from an FDA perspective. So welcome, Dr. Krauss. Uh, thanks, Susan, and thanks, of course, to the organizers for the invitation. And uh, what an amazing panel. Uh, thanks to my co-panelists for their excellent comments. What I like to do is emphasize the role of government agencies and processes in vaccine confidence. And I, I think we can all agree that while the average person may not trust the government as much as they used to, the average person still trusts their doctor. And if the doctor trusts government scientific agencies and the process, that can go a long ways towards maintaining confidence in vaccines. And notably in a pandemic, it's important to be fast but it's still at least as important to be right. And of course, it goes without saying, as you've heard from the other speakers, that once confidence is lost, it can be hard to regain. I think it's particularly important where claiming that decisions are science-based to maintain confidence that the decisions are truly based on science and not on politics. And in this pandemic, the US government made some major missteps. It clearly had little or nothing to do with the science, including authorization of hydroxychloroquine, which was later revoked, and changing and confusing guidance on masks. Now that doesn't mean that the science should be the only basis for making decisions, but when fundamentally political decisions are cloaked in science and are announced by the heads of scientific agencies, this does damage to trust in the objectivities of those agent, objectivity of those agencies. Early in the pandemic, the FDA's Office of Vaccines worked with developers to make sure that vaccine trials would be big enough and include enough follow-up to support scientifically rigorous conclusions, and also made sure that those studies would be designed in such a way as to get results rapidly. You may remember that there were people who wanted early trial results announced before the election in November 2020, even though the trials hadn't yet collected the data that they were designed to collect. Early announcements would have undermined fundamental principles of clinical trial conduct and would have undermined confidence in those trial results. FDA's Office of Vaccines strongly resisted pressures to allow this to happen and made sure that the guidance they provided to the companies about what would be needed was made public. We also announced that all major vaccine decisions would be discussed in advance by public advisory committees. This was an example of a situation where a government agency followed the science in spite of intense political pressure. The scientific and regulatory process, while often explained to the public by experts and agency heads, really takes place at a much lower level. Our increasing reliance on a small number of experts to convey information takes attention away from the many highly trained scientists who are involved in reviewing the data to make sure that the conclusions are justified and making sure that the right data was collected in the first place. These reviewers are advocates for the American people and for public health. And of course, there can be the potential for ten tension between what political leaders think should be done and what the reviewers think should be done. It's critically important that the agency leadership support the process that yields objective evaluations of the data. 
These advisory committees make a huge difference. They force all the data in the open and require the FDA to present its analyses to the world. Even when public health agencies don't strictly need advice on what to do, these open discussions provide a window into the process that increases confidence in the decisions that ultimately are made. So what happened with boosters? Well, an early announcement that boosters would be needed in everyone and available soon in the US before a careful review had taken place created a lot of confusion. Even looking back, the data now indicate that the third mRNA vaccine shot only made a meaningful difference in people who were at the highest risk of severe disease. And now we're talking about fourth shots. Although I believe this should have gone through an advisory committee, with a fourth dose, fourth dose CDC is being more careful, recommending one only in people with multiplying or with multiple underlying conditions to place them at risk of severe disease. But just yesterday, the president tweeted, if you're 50 and older or immunocompromised, get your second booster as soon as you're eligible. A statement that contradicts more nuanced recommendations from the very agencies that we need the public to trust. So we still haven't learned all the essential lessons. This isn't easy to get right, but a lot is at stake. So it's very important for the process, that this is the process that people trust, for that process to be followed and for the response to be coordinated. So uh, I'd just like to conclude my remarks by, by saying again that the objective review of highly experienced career government scientists has played a critically important role in vaccine confidence. It takes strong leadership to preserve the independence of that review. And the pandemic certainly created pressures to interfere with that independence. But we need to be careful because if confidence in these processes is lost, it'll be hard to regain. And I will stop there. Thank you. That was, as all the presentations were great. We're now going to, we have about 15 minutes for a panel discussion. And I'm hoping that you will all engage each other in your different perspectives, but I'm going to lead it off by asking the group. Um, we've heard a lot about missteps. We've heard about some positive things that were done. What do you think we're learning from these experiences that should inform our behavior in the next few months? Because as somebody pointed out, it's not over yet. Um, and what, what about prepar preparing for uh, the next pandemic? So I open that up to the group. Anybody want to comment? I would like to uh, to start with a with a last part of your question. How do we okay. prepare for the next pandemic? I think what I've realized in uh, Israel experience is that we built a lot of things during COVID nineteen. We have all the test results streamed to the Ministry of Health daily. Um, we have reports, automatic reports, computerized from our, all our hospitals on the status of every COVID-19 patient. Um, serology tests, everything is really streamed online and it has been extremely helpful for us um, to know, to manage the pandemic. Uh, when we started vaccinated everyone, all the vaccination centers, whether it was HMOs or hospitals, shared to one database of all vaccines. So we can really see vaccine effectiveness and everything. However, if in two years we have, let's say Ebola, we have nothing. Everything was built for COVID-19 and doing this while we were running during the pandemic. And so one thing that I realized uh, is that we have to build a better system. We have to build a flexible system that we can get data on things that are in the future. We don't even know what they are. I don't know if it will be a PCR or a sweat test or a urine test, but we need to make sure we have a systems that we can pull data. Uh, we can actually monitor data uh, with a, a AI system that tracks whether something wrong is happening and then pull the data when we need it uh, and not build everything from scratch. So what, that's one of our learning and we're trying to build this really smart system right now. So if, if I may add to that really excellent comment, um, uh, uh, Susan, by saying that uh, there are a number of activities in Africa uh, underway uh, to create uh, vaccine manufacturing sites. And we've learned uh, uh, yesterday's discussion, is, it's a complicated business because you have to succeed and we don't quite know how to succeed, but the worst thing that can happen is to fail. Uh, and one of the areas of failure is to be completely mesmerized by RNA technology, which of course is fabulous and so on. And what countries have to do is in fact, uh, invest in a platform 
that makes possible a sustainable business uh, in a variety of platforms that serves the national need. And so I think that that's required, uh, um, and especially uh, in countries that uh, are resource stressed. So, that, so that's the one lesson I think uh, I've learned. The, the, the second is that we really need to have a system in place where governments can deal with pandemic response in what's called a transversal way. That is a number of government agencies, governments are organized, as you know, as silos, but pandemic response requires massive cooperation across departments of state and departments of government, and there are no systems in place um, really prior to this pandemic, except in a few countries to do that, certainly on the African continent. And one of the things we've learned is that African governments have learned from this experience that that's what you need to do, and they just essentially created what they had on the basis of the existing laws and the basis of the existing actual need to respond. So, um, so what we need is transversal government. And, and finally, politicians respond to crises. They never invest in preparedness because it brings them nothing. Nothing happens. There's no episode. There's no media attention. So what's required is to get governments to commit to invest using metrics to invest in pandemic preparedness and to create that system and to be governments be held to account for that. And parliamentarians and politicians must be sure to hold governments to account for having a planned system of financing preparedness. Well, oh, yeah, go ahead, Natalie. You're muted. Yes, it has to happen. Well, uh, I was just going to add to that, that we can invest all we want in technology and in preparedness and manufacturing vaccines, it will get us nowhere if we don't invest in communication. And we have to invest in science communication with the public and with politicians and government, because otherwise public policies for pandemic preparedness or anything else will not be based on science because our government officers and parliament members are not usually prepared to understand science in the in a way that they can use it for policy making. So uh, I think we, we really should invest in training these people to understand scientific process. We don't want them to become scientists, but we really should train our scientists to talk to politicians and government officers and government officers and politicians to listen to them and understand them. And it's a two way communication that's very difficult to build. And if we don't invest in building that, we can have all the vaccines we want. People won't take them. No, I was really um, struck and I'd like to hear people talk about, you know, the relationship of science and politics and managing politicians now, so to speak, because on the one hand, even, you know, Phil, you were talking about tweeting a positive vaccine message, but it's not really maybe the message that we wanted tweeted. And you talked about, you know, a message that you're going to turn into an alligator. So they seem either on the positive or negative side, not to really quite get it right. And what are we learning about how to manage that? Does anybody want to comment on that? Well, I think that we should remember that the people who are the politicians who you want to communicate to have been educated in a system where they have a set of beliefs about science they've been given that are simply untrue. And until we disabuse people of these beliefs of, of single right answers, of simplified um, uh, solutions, then we'll get nowhere with communication. We won't have real transparency, as Sharon insisted we needed, just by opening records but by admitting freely that uncertainty and a certain irreducible complexity is at the base of this and we can manage it, but we won't manage it without making a few missteps. And those missteps can't be amplified into catastrophic criticisms. Right, so it starts in elementary school. Yeah, Phil? Uh, yeah, I, I just wanted to put in a plug for the WHO is playing an essential role in the science communication. Because from the beginning of the pandemic, what the WHO did was they brought people together from different countries who were working on different aspects of trying to, to solve the problems and, and, and really used their convening power to get people to talk with each other 
and to understand their differences and to reach conclusions about what they thought the science showed. And these kinds of dis discussions could occur in a non-political environment where uh, uh, other aspects uh, real, besides the science and, and what it, does an objective review of the data show really uh, uh, could be set aside. And of course, the tragedy of all of this is that the WHO uh, usually doesn't attract the funding that it needs. Um, and it's the very politicians who may feel a little bit threatened by having these kinds of objective reviews, who, who perhaps are reluctant to send too much money to the WHO to, uh, uh, to have the, this kind of work done. But I do not think we would be where we are now in the pandemic if it wasn't for the scientific discussions that the WHO led. Literally since uh, the very beginning of the pandemic, uh, the WHO held an international lab meeting with all of the major labs that were working in this area where every week people presented their data. They presented the data that uh, was, was relevant to developing vaccines, in many cases, data that had not been published yet or not even put forward in preprint so that the rest of the scientific committee community could build on what happened, what they were doing, and so that uh, um, uh, people could then receive input of uh, a, a much larger group into what the right next steps would be. And, and so these, these are the kinds of things that improve worldwide communication and uh, um, it's organizations like the WHO that, that, that are essential for that. And so uh, I, I, I do think that uh, part of the solution going forward and for the next pandemic is to make sure that the WHO is adequately funded to continue this kind of work and to enhance it. Yeah, I, so may I add to that? About that. Oh, go on, Wilma. Yeah, I just wanted to say, added to the WHO, just to recognize UNICEF. Um, um, UNICEF has uh, a really quite powerful uh, division uh, that uh, uses social science analytics to communicate the risk. Uh, you would also know that UNICEF is a monopsony when it comes to vaccine acquisition and supply to the developing world. So I just wanted to say that it's the WHO, which I think is deliberately underfunded, by the way, <laughs> to keep it weak. Um, and uh, we should do something about the funding mechanism for the WHO, finally, um, to upscale its uh, resource base. But that UNICEF itself uh, is also a very, very important uh, global agency to recognize. Stuart, you were going to say something? Uh, I, I just wanted to say that we should be careful about beating ourselves up too much over the last two years. After all, in 1918, the flu, the, pa the flu pandemic killed over 50 million people. That's almost an order of magnitude greater than what we're suffering today. And the difference is today we have a WHO, today we have worldwide systems, today we have a science that can um, that can give us a genetic uh, um, readout of, of the virus in 10 days after its first report. And so these, these are important things to recognize and these are important areas to strengthen. Uh, we're lucky this virus has kind of x-rayed our society and shown every weak spot that there is from health disparities to economics to science weaknesses and communication and we should use it to take account of all of those things but we shouldn't beat ourselves up too much in doing so no, i do think and dr Wolinsky talked about this on one of the earlier days like there's a lot to be proud of um there's also a lot to learn but you're absolutely right yes. i mean who thought we'd have a vaccine this quickly and distributed to so many people um, this quickly, but there are certainly gaps. Um, we have just a few minutes. Does anybody have a burning comment or uh, question they'd like to make before we move on to the next section? Well, if I can just make a quick remark, uh, is, is I hope I didn't come across as being too critical of what's happened. I think we've done amazingly well, uh, but I am. I do think one of the areas for improvement is in trying to insulate the public health agencies from politics more than they currently are. And this is certainly true in the US and I see that this is true in many of the other places we've heard about as well. No, I think uh, that I, I did not hear you as being overly critical. And I, I do think that is an important point because even if we improve on science education, it would help. They still aren't always completely in the control of what you'd like them to be in the control of. Uh, Wilma, did you have a last comment? Yes, I just wanted to say one of the uh, issues that uh, I'm really concerned about is the fact that um, that many African governments have underinvested serially in their health systems, and they've also underinvested in university science and technology education. 
at a tertiary and secondary level, and that um, and that uh, that we can do a lot better in that respect. Uh, and then just finally, uh, all, I agree with the issue around uh, the public understanding of science and improved risk communication. I can count three African countries that has an organized program in the public under uh, um, uh, understanding of science, and that's in any event an afterthought. So there's room to do something different in that respect as well. All right, well with that um, comment, I'd like to thank our panelists. It was a great conversation. Um, it was really interesting to hear the different perspectives. And we're gonna move to the second part of today's, which is that um, we are very fortunate to have Meg Terrell here. She is a CNBC senior health and science reporter um, since joining, she has covered new medicines for Alzheimer's, cancer, and rare diseases. In addition, she has tracked public health emergencies, including Ebola, Zika, and COVID-19. And she is going to interview two people. Um, we're going to start with the Honorable um, Mitastakis, who is, um, however, that's going to be a pre-recorded video because like being able to teleport to Israel, um, she was not able to be here today, but was able to provide the um, interview. She is the Prime Minister of the Hellenic Republic. She was sworn in on July 8th, 2019, just in time for the pandemic. After becoming the pre president, he managed to modernize the party, refresh its membership base, create a system of funding based on small annual do donations and implemented a code of transparency and accountability for operations of the party. So with that, I will turn it over to the pre-recorded uh, video. Prime Minister, it's great to have you. Thank you so much for having this conversation with us. I thought it might be helpful to start maybe by taking a look at where Greece is now in terms of COVID. It seems like looking at the numbers, uh, you have had the same sort of wave of BA2 that much of Europe has experienced that seems to be coming down. Tell us what, what the situation is right now. Yes, uh, we, we went through the, uh, the wave of um, uh, Omicron too, but we see a decline in the number of cases as was expected by our models. Uh, I myself um, um, uh, got uh, good COVID uh, 10 days ago, um, and I went through the process of dealing with um, um, uh, Omicron too without any, any real symptoms. But again, it's uh, you know testimony to, uh, to the fact that the triple vaccination really works and it does protect you against uh, serious illness, which is the argument we've been making from um, uh, from the very uh, beginning again. Um, the number of cases, um, uh, I think, is, is not going to be that that relevant. We, we are looking at the capacity of our healthcare system and, of course, what is happening in our uh, uh, ICU uh, beds and yeah. use, uh, over the past uh, years. Right, yes. we have mm -hmm. a, you know, a steady decline um, uh, and uh, have no particular <laughs> pressure in terms of our healthcare system now, which is something which is rather uh, comforting. I, I do expect, uh, you know, as, as we enter the, you know, the, the spring, um, uh, this, uh, this way to decline. And of course, we need to start making preparations for what will happen in, in, in autumn. And we're talking to our experts regarding you know, vaccination protocols um, uh, come uh, September, uh, October. So cautious, cautiously, uh, cautiously optimistic that, as you know, this virus has uh, surprised us uh, numerous times. Yeah, absolutely. And I think a lot of us here in the United States are looking to the experience in Europe as far as the impact on the healthcare system, even as you are seeing more cases. And so right now, you're not seeing the healthcare system get overwhelmed. The ICUs aren't as full as you've seen with previous waves. Yeah, uh, we are at approximately half the number of um, ICU occupancy where we were um, uh, three months ago. Uh, so um, we, as we came out of Delta, we were hit by the first um, uh, uh, Omicron uh, wave. And as Omicron became more dominant, um, we saw what we saw in most countries, number of cases uh, uh, increased, but uh, not a proportionate increase uh, in, in the number of hospitalizations and certainly fewer people uh, getting uh, uh, seriously 
uh, sick, uh, and I expect this trend uh, to continue. We are at um, you know 85 percent uh, you know vaccination for our adult population, which is as high as as, as I think we can we can get. We tried very hard you know to push um, uh, the numbers up uh, over the past um, uh, six months. Uh, it is very clear that uh, um, if you're vaccinated, you still have a pretty high chance of of, of, of getting uh, you know, Omicron too. It is highly highly uh, contagious, uh, but again. Uh, uh, it's, it's going to be very mild uh, for, for most people, and it will not put our healthcare system under significant strain. Mm. Well, let's talk about getting to that 85% of the adult population vaccinated, maybe even going back to the beginning. Uh, what was the approach that Greece took to the vaccine rollout uh, from the beginning? What did you find were the great successes of the rollout? What were the challenges, and how have you tried to overcome those and convince more folks to get vaccinated? So, First of all, it, it was indeed remarkable that uh, we managed to have uh, you know, a vaccine uh, you know, a year after we first discovered COVID. I think it was a miracle of science. Uh, and uh, uh, it, uh, it, it allowed us also from a public health point of view to take a, a different perspective in terms of how we deliver a, vac a vaccine to the entire population. So um, we set up a system that was um, fully uh, digital. Um, uh, we I made sure that uh, we were consistent in terms of delivering quality services to people who got vaccinated. Uh, we, um, I mean, our appointments were literally to the minute when first people, we, we used an SMS system to um, uh, agree to uh, inform people regarding their appointment. At the, at the beginning, people were quite surprised. They didn't expect this sort of um, a digital interaction with the state. Uh, but they were pleasantly surprised once they interacted with our uh, vaccination uh, infrastructure, and I think this built, you know, a lot of a lot of trust uh, in the ability of, um, uh, of of the system to uh, deliver uh, a record number of vaccines uh, in a relatively short period of time. So I think in the beginning it was easy to get the you know, 50 percent of the population vaccinated, and then of course we we started hitting um, obstacles, and, and then we started. Uh, we had to think um, um, uh, creatively about using incentives and disincentives to convince those who were relatively hesitant to actually uh, get vaccinated. Let me just give you um, uh, two examples. I think, uh, by the way, I think we ran a, a pretty good communications campaign, uh, but uh, at some point this also reached its, um, uh, its, its limit. I mean, making the case that vaccines are, are safe and that they save. Lies, but at some point we had to use nudges, for example, for the young people who initially were quite hesitant to get vaccinated because they thought that COVID didn't really uh, affect them. We used what we call the Freedom Pass, which was essentially 150 euros um, in a digital card that they could use for very specific services, you know, travel, and, you know, some entertainment data. And actually, this um, uh, this incentive really uh, kickstarted the vaccination amongst um, uh, the younger people. So it, it worked really, really well. Uh, and at some point um, uh, in, in, in October, we realized that we still had a significant number of older people um, who were not vaccinated. And actually, those are the people who disproportionately got ill and, and, and unfortunately passed away. I mean, uh, uh, so at some point, we were one of the very few countries that imposed a mandatory vaccination for those citizens above 60. Uh, and we actually imposed a fine. Um, for those who uh, decided not to get vaccinated. Was it a successful policy? I think yes, because at that stage we had 500,000 um, uh, uh, older Greeks who um, uh, were not vaccinated, and half of them decided to take the step to get vaccinated. So that's exactly the, that, that's a policy that helped us push our overall vaccination rates about uh, 80%. Uh, and of course, uh, the remaining, you know, 250,000, I don't think they will ever get vaccinated. So at some point we will freeze this fine because it keeps accumulating every month. Uh, but we made it uh, you know, very clear that we want to use whatever levers we have to, to convince people that they should get uh, uh, vaccinated. So um, again, I think we've, we've reached our limits. Of course, the demographics of Greece also don't work in our favor. Um, we have a relatively older population. Uh, which means that proportionately you'd expect more deaths in Greece than you would expect in a, uh, in a uh, younger uh, country. But uh, you know, overall, we did very well during the first wave. 
uh, less well during the uh, subsequent um, race, but I think we all learned during the process. Uh, and we constantly had to adjust our strategy based on you know, real uh, evidence in the real world. And then you mentioned, you know, the messaging campaign and also the, the outreach from the government, which sounds very organized. It would have been nice to have experienced a similar thing here, although we did on certain levels in the United States. Uh, but what did you find was the most effective in terms of the who the messengers were, the levels of government that were communicating to people? Uh, what was the best way to, to reach people and to, to establish that trust as you were doing the vaccine rollout? Okay. You have to let the experts talk. And this worked very well during the first phase of the vaccine. Then you suddenly start bumping into the problem that not all experts say the same things. So, <laughs> which is a, what you would expect when you don't exactly know what is happening um, with, uh, with, with the new pandemic. Um, I, I always thought that the story of those people who actually got really sick and were unvaccinated were very convincing because they were describing you know, what happened to them, the, you know, the near death experience. Uh, of being in an ICU and the regret that they felt for not taking the step to get vaccinated. So I think this, in, in my mind, this was always a very, very um, uh, powerful message. Uh, and of course, at some point, most European countries, and we were at the forefront of this, we made life very difficult for those who were unvaccinated so they could not have access to indoor entertainment. So there was a price to pay uh, should you choose to be um, uh, uh, and vaccinated, um, uh, but uh, uh, it's it's striking that after a certain point, no matter how much, how many times we repeated the story, that you're twenty times as you know as likely to get seriously sick if you're unvaccinated. Um, you know, with, with some people, the message just does not uh, resonate, and you you have to uh, accept that fact that you will reach a limit. But if you had asked me eighteen months ago. If we were, if we would have been able to get to 85 percent of the adult population, I'd say probably no. Uh, the, the problem was that initially we thought that 70 percent would have been enough, but as the virus kept mutating, we needed to to push um, uh, immunity higher uh, and uh, and higher. And unfortunately, in Greece, um, we reached that number relatively late. So we were really hit by Delta uh, during the uh, um, the fall. In early winter of 2021, and that's where we actually suffered most of our um, uh, casualties. Had we been able to convince people to get vaccinated earlier, we would have avoided a lot of these deaths. Truly really tragic because they were unnecessary. And how has have the booster rollouts gone? What has been the sort of enthusiasm for uptake of the booster shots, and what kinds of strategies are you using there? Oh, we were one of the first to actually. Um, uh, we, we lowered, you know, the we allowed people to get their boosters after three months after they got their, uh, uh, their second shots. It was not that difficult to convince people to get their booster shots because um, they had already taken the plunge. Uh, and we've had a pretty good uptake when it comes to the boosters. And when it became obvious that we actually needed the booster to be, to be, to be safer, uh, our message was, uh, uh, was easier. Uh, of course, there's still you know, a certain percentage of people who got their first two vaccines and chose not to get their booster, which is sort of puzzling. Um, uh, to me, but in general, uh, we had no no difficulties uh, getting people boosted, which makes me also optimistic that should we choose to go for a fourth dose, which I think is going to be the case, especially above a certain age, that we will have again no difficulties come September to convince people that this is something that they need to do. Uh, it may become part of the yearly ritual. Maybe at some point we'll have just one vaccine for, you know, for flu and COVID. Uh, if, if science were to uh, to allow us to uh, to do that, uh, but I don't expect much hesitancy in terms of people actually getting uh, getting boosted. Of course, now nobody's talking about COVID. Uh, everyone's talking about Ukraine and um, and the rising prices. But we're still being we're still being relatively we removed gradually removed restrictions. But again, we were on the slow side, so we still have mandatory masks, for example. Uh, uh, indoors and for public transportation, uh, we'll keep masks. And uh, for the next month, at least, we will also keep a COVID certificate. Um, uh, uh, you know, come May, people are going to be mostly outdoors. So all this is not going to become particularly relevant. And I do expect a fully normal summer. It's also important for us because, of course, Greece is a big tourism nation. We want people to, to travel, you know, safely and without the hassles that they had to go through over the past two years. That makes sense. Uh, so for the fourth dose, 
you're thinking of that more as potential preparation for the fall, not something necessarily that needs to be done amid dealing with BA2 or Omicron 2 right now. Here in the United States, we're talking about fourth doses for certain populations uh, pretty imminently. No, we, I mean, our experts have not recommended the fourth dose, uh, fourth dose, uh, dose um, um, uh, immediately, I think. But I think we're probably, we're probably ahead of you. So I think in, in our case, I would expect, and as the weather improves, uh, uh, Omicron to, to, um, uh, to, to, to decline uh, over the next um, you know, weeks. So I think the real discussion is going to be um, uh, how will we prepare for the fall and what will our experts tell us uh, you know, come September. What role have you seen for the COVID drugs, particularly the outpatient therapies, uh, the antiviral drugs, which are just more recently available, and also the COVID antibody drugs? How much are those accessible and available there and that you'll rely They've been accessible and, um, and available and we've used you know, very specific protocols um, uh, as uh, as designated by our uh, health uh, experts. I think they certainly helped. And now that we will also have, uh, you know, the, uh, the Pfizer drug is, is also uh, now available. I think it's an additional weapon um, we have. Again, we have not fully tested its efficacy because it just became available, but you know, clinical trials indicate that uh, it works uh, rather well. So it gives us an additional level of comfort that we have uh, additional treatments to make sure that people don't get severely sick. And is this, the system set up in a way that can deliver a drug like that effectively? It sounds like you maybe it, it, it is even better than you know, what we have in the United States. We're so fragmented and we've seen We've had these drugs available for a while, but it's very difficult for people to get them. You're supposed to take them within the first five days of having COVID. So now we're trying to do this thing where we test and treat right there in a pharmacy. Is the system better worked out there where you can be a little bit more organized? Well, I don't know if it's a question of organization or a question of size and centralization. We run COVID centrally, and I think for a country of 10 million, this is perfectly good. Uh, and when we talk about self-tests and other area where I think we've been extremely successful. You know, um, we've been offering you know, free self-tests to students for the past months. Um, uh, and all students get two. Uh, occasionally, they even got three self-tests, uh, and but also to, to, to the rest of the population. So we use self-tests extensively. They were incredibly valuable in terms of helping us identify asymptomatic COVID cases. We deliver them through the pharmacies, through our central uh, registry. It's incredible how even young kids became very experienced in administering the self-tests themselves. Uh, initially, people were skeptical, but it worked uh, ex extremely well. We we're very happy that we, we use them. We're, we're scaling them down now because there's uh, less of a uh, need for them. Uh, but uh, we had the advantage of running our COVID strategy uh, centrally. And most of them um, competencies are with the central government, so we did not have to deal with states or regions. That made our life um, uh, easier. Uh, so everything was run centrally, perfectly doable for a country of 10 million. But you know, the United States is, of course, different size, different challenges, different you know federal organization. And as you are looking forward to the fall, but also preparing for what hopefully will be a normal summer, how do you balance the ability to ramp? you know, free tests back up, the ability to have vaccine supply, to get the public back on board if you need to, to prepare for a potential fall wave. What do you think the receptiveness among the, pu the public will be to that? Well, that's a million dollar um, uh, question, Meg. People are really tired. I don't think people will, will accept restricted measures. I mean, we're done with those. Uh, and at some point, there is also, you know, a degree of personal responsibility. You don't want to get vaccinated. You should know that you have a, a much, much higher chance of getting uh, of, of getting sick and ending up in a uh, in, in hospital. We've done everything within our capacity uh, to convince people to get vaccinated, and most of the people have uh, made the right um, you know, choice. Uh, they've made the right uh, decision. But we cannot impose additional constraints and economic pain on top of everything we're experiencing with the war on, on, on those who have done the right thing. So uh, I do not expect us to return to restrictive measures uh, unless all, all health breaks loose and we're faced with some sort of uh, you know, very strange um, uh, variant. But um, uh, right now, I think we can convince the population to get, if, if we, uh, to get the fourth dose for those who 
you need to put the foot to those and to, to take some basic precautions. You know, wearing a mask, where a mask is, um, uh, is, uh, is necessary, you know, taking you know, basic hygiene measures. But in terms of restrictive measures, I don't think there is any bandwidth um, for going back to, to those. And you know, are the resources there to be able to ramp up you know, the testing infrastructure and things like that again? One of the things we're running into in the United States is sort of a reluctance to provide more COVID response funding uh, right now in Congress. So we're talking about potentially not having enough vaccines for the fall if everybody needs them, not being able to maintain our testing infrastructure and things like that. So we'll make sure that we have enough tests. Uh, again, we'll order as many tests as we need. We've done so, and I think it was a good investment. Uh, and we'll have enough um, vaccines and enough tests. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's not going to be an issue. Well, I also want to ask you in our last couple of minutes just about <laughs> taking away from this experience, which we're still in, obviously. But as you note, there is a lot of other things happening right now. That it's hard to maintain focus on what we've just been through over the last two years. So as we sort of go to this new phase of the pandemic, how do you ensure preparedness, not just for the next wave, but for the potential next health threat and the next pandemic? Um, how do you make sure that all of this collective experience isn't forgotten and instead put to some good use to better prepare for the next thing? I think it's an excellent question. And we, we said from the beginning that we want to take lessons um, from COVID. We need to assess what we did well. And we need to, to be brutally honest uh, in terms of highlighting the shortcomings of our national health system, because we do have a national health system, which I think has served us well, uh, but uh, certainly can be improved. Uh, and uh, there are lessons to be learned uh, from COVID. Uh, let me just give you two examples. We need more emphasis on primary care, um, which was always a shortcoming uh, of our system. People ended up in the hospitals way too, way too early. Uh, we need more focus on, on, on basic public um, health measures, you know, educating people what it means to live a healthy life. Uh, and we're spending a lot of um, uh, a lot of money now on, on prevention. For example, we're starting a, you know, a screening process for breast cancer for every, every woman you know, age 50 or above will have access um, uh, to, a, to, to a free um, uh, screening uh, test. And, and of course, we also look at our hospitals and we realize that not all hospitals offer the same quality of care. That is why we have actually worked with the WHO to set up a, a regional quality of care office in Greece. I want to make sure that regardless of you find yourself in a you know in a big hospital in Athens or in a small regional hospital in northern Greece, that you will receive the same basic quality of care. And we've set up um, you know a, a unit within the Ministry of Health that is looking at uh, at uh, quality of care. We've hired many more people. It was an opportunity to accelerate hirings, especially in terms of nurses. Uh, we had enough doctors. We did not have enough nurses, so we've added. Um, um, uh, a lot of you know support staff uh, to our healthcare uh, system, and we want to use the crisis to highlight the importance of having an, an efficient and well-run national uh, health system that uh, is going to be able to meet the challenges of the future. So, in, in, in that sense, uh, we're not going to forget, even if COVID disappears tomorrow, and it's not going to disappear tomorrow. I think we owe it to the people who die tragically, to make sure that we will be better prepared um, in the future, whether it's a pandemic or whether it's chronic diseases, uh, which at the end of the day uh, are the, the main cause for most of the deaths, or at least most of the premature deaths um, that we are um, uh, facing uh, in the uh, developed um, world. So um, when you talk of, for example, diabetes, obesity, childhood obesity, these are real concerns for us. Uh, and uh, these are the, uh, you know, the, the healthcare crisis of the future that need to be addressed um, today. So I'm sure everyone would be tempted to breathe a sigh of relief once we officially state that the pandemic is over. That would be a mistake, a big mistake, because we learned a lot during the pandemic. Health is, is, is so important and such an obligation of the state to be able to provide quality um, in, in the case of Greece, free healthcare access to uh, to everyone. That these are the lessons that we need to take um, with us, and that's the direction towards which we need to work. Well, very helpful lessons, and just very helpful to get to hear from you about the experience there. Uh, thank you so much for taking this time. Thank you. It was a pleasure talking to you, and all the best. 
so that was um, a really interesting interview and we're glad that Meg you could do that ahead of time so we could um, participate um, we're now gonna Meg is gonna live interview da Dame Kate Bingham who has joined us um, there she is she is the managing partner of SV health investors her biotech investments included the launch of six drugs for treatment of patients with inflammatory autoimmune diseases and cancer and with that, Meg, I'll turn it over to you to start the interview. Well, thanks so much, Dr. Rosenthal and Dame Kate Bingham. Thanks so much for being here to talk with us. I'm really excited to get to talk with you. Well, I'm um, incredibly excited because I listen to your Read Out Loud uh, podcast. So I feel like <laughs> I know you incredibly well. So thank you so much for having me. You know what I realized today, actually, is that the first time I was ever on that podcast before I became a host, I was a guest they interviewed you on the same episode. So <laughs> we have that in common. Um, so let's talk about your time um, as the chair of UK's vaccine task force, which was May to December of 2020, just an incredible period of collective human history, which culminated of course, with the first vaccine approval in the world, the UK approval of the Pfizer vaccine and then the AstraZeneca vaccine as well. Uh, maybe just tell us about the sort of structure of the vaccine task force, uh, the mandate from the UK government, uh, how it compares you know, with what some of us in the United States may know better in terms of Operation Warp Speed. Uh, great, so uh, Warp Speed I think was fantastic and I'm a, a huge fan and I spoke to uh, Monsef every other week. So um, it was operating, it was a little bit different. So um, I reported directly to the Prime Minister. He gave me three goals, which was to secure, secure vaccines for the UK, to secure vaccines for the world, as in to make sure that any successful vaccine was, was fairly and equitably distributed, and then to make sure the plans, plans were put in place so that we'd be better set up for next time. And um, when I uh, took on the job, I, I gave a, I mean, first of all, it took me 24 hours to agree to do it. And then I came back with um, a series of conditions uh, that, oh, that I required to take on the role. The first was that I reported to the PM because I needed to ensure that we had ultimate uh, authority to, to act. Second of all, um, uh, I wanted to be able to hire my own team. Uh, third was that there would be a defined budget and uh, rapid decision making um, process, um, uh, which really was important because I hadn't worked in government before, uh, but I did know that government is not known for quick decision making. Um, and so basically, and of course, we had a very clear mandate. So those were the conditions. And so basically, um, I did very similar to, to uh, what happened in Warp Speed, except that I think we were probably a little bit more remote from government from that perspective. So um, I basically recruited a small team of people who are the technical experts to work with me. So people to evaluate the different um, vaccines and uh, prioritize them and, and recommend uh, somebody to help. Uh, and these had teams below them, of course. And then uh, somebody leading on, on scale up and manufacturing, somebody leading on clinical trials, and then somebody working with industry to look at long-term pandemic uh, capability and preparedness. So um, that, um, and, and that will work pretty well, actually. The government, uh, in the UK put together an investment committee, just like a venture capital uh, investment committee, which was four ministers from the government. So they took the spending decisions. We provided the advice. The civil servants made, made sure that what we were suggesting was legal and all the right processes were followed um, and, the, and the ministers took the decision, but we were able to make decisions very quickly. So uh, I was not constrained by government decision making, which is probably a first, I should think, in terms of um, being able to actually say that uh, in, in terms of how we were able to work. So I think with, with Warp Speed, there was a greater involvement with NIH, um, CDC and some of the other um, key uh, offices um, in the States, whereas I think we were, we interface with them because, of course, the my role was all about getting the vaccines ready to, to be put into people's arms. But the actual act of uh, administration was handled by um, uh, through the Department of Health, so through the NHS. Um, and and so we had to, we interfaced with them, of course, but we weren't responsible for actually putting the jabs in people's arms. 
Sorry, it took me a sec to unmute. The, the putting the jabs into people's arms was the part that we ended up having a few more problems uh, initially here in the United States. What did you find about that structure, um, the reporting directly to the prime minister, but the, the kind of independence that you also had? Um, it, it sounds like that worked really well. Were there any challenges to that structure, uh, any kinds of interactions you had with the government as well? <laughs> So the, the structure actually worked just fine. Um, and I wouldn't change it if, you know, knowing what I know now, there's no reason to change how it works. So we, I brought the technical experts. And then the way it works in this country is um, you have a director general who's the sort of senior civil servant who makes sure that the, the actual processes of government are followed correctly. My um, director general was an ex uh, actually private sector most recently, but had a career in the army, starting off as a bomb disposal engineer, but basically ended up running big complex uh, uh, projects. So this was small beer compared with what he was used to. Um, he then brought in place brought into the team the experts in diplomacy so basically somebody to speak to all the other countries around the world um uh commercial negotiation because we obviously the contracts had to uh, be suitable for for the public sector for the government which is somewhat different from what i would be signing in in our venture capital deals um and in project management so actually it was that combination of skills that worked incredibly well we never met each other we did everything on zoom and so again i think that was a difference i think again in, in warp speed it was a bit more centralized around uh, dc whereas I was in mid Wales and goodness knows where everybody else was, but we all did the whole thing on 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 Zoom um, and uh, the including the investment committee. So actually, the structure worked incredibly well. The challenges I found uh, was the fact that we don't have a very scientifically literate government um, and the real difficulties is. Um, it was fine actually as with us because we were just able to recruit the team we needed but in terms of the long-term planning and recognizing the long-term implications of decisions that are taken um actually if you're not a steeped in our sector and understand what it takes to actually discover develop scale up test manufacture license uh whether they're vaccines or therapeutics it's very difficult to to really take good decisions so as far as i was concerned it was all just fine because we made proposals and our proposals were accepted but as far as a broader comment on on governments in general uh my experience was there were just too many you know liberal art majors uh, we have less than 10 percent of our civil service have stem degrees and that's not a good place to be especially in a technology driven society that we now live in what were some of the the problems that resulted from that a government perhaps not so steeped in in science and really understanding the long-term implications is there an example of something that you know a decision that was made or some communication uh, that was taken that was perhaps not done the, in the best way so the, the main issue actually um, was more when I came in, it was it was clear when I went back and looked at some of the recommendations that had been given uh, to ministers at an early stage to support, for example, the Oxford and the Imperial vaccines. Um, I could see that they were written not by people who weren't hardworking and clever and all of that, but they just weren't. This wasn't their area. And I could see basic mistakes in how this was even being discussed as to how the processes would work and what the outcomes should be. And what I was struck by was the fact that the people writing it didn't recognise there was a problem, and nor did the people reading it recognise there was a problem. So again, from my perspective, I arrived as chair, chair in um, uh, May, and we treated this, oh, I treated this because I'm a lifelong venture capitalist, I treated this like a venture capital um, uh, investment. And so even though we'd started funding Oxford and Imperial as, as two homegrown vaccines, um, I, um, slightly to their uh, annoyance, insisted on doing full due diligence as if it was a de novo investment so that I understood exactly what the status was, so that we understood the risks, returns, benefits, and, and what we needed to mitigate or where the gaps were so that we could then fill them. So that, that was where I saw the challenges were was just that the the teams that were that had originally been brought in to try and think about this was 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 complicated. Um, 
so that was the main thing. I mean, of course, there were challenges whenever you're getting any parts of government to talk to each other. Um, we set up a national citizens registry so that we could get clinical trials enrolled very quickly. And um, we faced all sorts of bumps in terms of, I mean, I wanted it up and running in six weeks. And getting that, uh, getting through the sort of bureaucratic hurdles of what was what can you legally do uh, and how should that be set up so you get patient consent in the, or volunteer consent in the right way? Those those sorts of things uh, took some time. And then when we we beta tested the, the system, but there were still um, whole, you know, um, flaws in how it had been designed. And when we ultimately launched it, um, it wasn't as slick as it should be. We had over, I want to say, 20,000 people who were in limbo when they tried to enrol in this system that it didn't it didn't work. So things like doing things in a hurry and when you have to get different parts of government to work with each other just takes time. But still, you know, it was up and running properly within eight weeks. And we've now got half a million people, a third of which are over the age of 60. Um, and we've enrolled now about 50,000 people into, into 18 different vaccine trials, whether it's, you know, pregnant women or the different vaccine types or, you know, different um, uh, protocols. So it's, it's worked out well, but it's certainly not smooth sailing the whole time. One of the things I heard you say, actually, in that interview on the Read Out Loud podcast, which was from July of 2020, was that we didn't know, obviously, how well the vaccines were going to work, or even if we have vaccines at that point. But you said that you were trying to communicate to people at that point that we shouldn't necessarily expect sterilizing immunity, that what we might hope for is, you know, the protection against symptomatic disease or severe disease. How well do you think that kind of messaging got through? Do you feel like it was a unified message? Uh, and, and what has been the result of the messaging around vaccines um, based on the original results and then how the virus has changed and therefore how our protection against the virus has changed over the you know year or so since then? Yeah, so my, my um, responsibility was not to be the government mouthpiece on, uh, you know, dealing with vaccine hesitancy or, or, or trying to persuade people to take vaccines. But my but um, my role was around how do you get people how do you get vaccines most rapidly to uh, initially the UK public so so that's why for example the registry was critical because you can't set up a um, a registry of people if people don't know anything about it or why they should do it so actually the there was a massive vacuum of information uh, I would say in the UK and a huge thirst for knowledge, because everybody saw vaccines really as the near term way out of the pandemic. Um, and, and so there was a there was a vast amount of, of public interest as to, you know, what should we expect and how might they work and what are all these different formats and should we be worried about the safety because they're being developed so quickly. Um, and in my very limited sphere, I mean, I think we dealt with a lot of that. Um, we clearly uh, had much higher take up than was we'd been uh, advised to expect. So the advice on take up was based on the flu vaccine. And we'd been told, you know, expect a 75% take up for older adults. And as they get older, you probably get a higher take up. And as it was, we were you know, in the 90s. So it's it was a much higher take up. So I think messaging broadly um, was well received. And actually one example was um, when the there was a lot of media interest around the potential side effects of the clotting um, related to the AstraZeneca vaccine, um, the Sun newspaper, which I don't know quite what the equivalent is in the States, but it's, it is, um, a newspaper which is 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 I mean basically not a sophisticated newspaper. I'm not sure otherwise how to describe it. And um, they had as their frontline headline 0 0.0000001 of a chance that you will end up with you know a clotting disorder. And so the fact that 
the, you know, a working class newspaper was printing basically a statistical headline to say you've got a very low chance of actually suffering any side effect from taking this vaccine, um, showed that the level of interest in, in vaccines and the risk versus benefit was being taken uh, at a very serious level throughout the whole population by the media. So actually, I think the media by and large, the scientific media, um, translating even to the front page of The Sun, um, did incredibly well. And in, for example, that when Novavax's data came out, um, the phase three data, um, that again was a front page uh, article um, in, in one of these other newspapers. So I think the messaging was pretty good, actually. Um, our, we do, of course, have vaccine hesitancy and anti-vax, but probably not quite as extreme as in the US. And I think by and large, the, the messaging was good. So nobody uh, saying that you're going to turn into an alligator if you uh, get a vaccine which you learned from Brazil earlier. <laughs> Well, there was some disinformation, yes. So that there was a, there was the, you know, potentially other state actors were trying to discredit the Oxford vaccine with, you know, pictures of chimpanzees and saying, you know, if you take this, you'll turn into a chimp and all of this. So that was known, but all of that, the, you know, the security and intelligence services identified that ahead of time and then diffused it by um, publishing saying, you know, we've now discovered this and, um, this is all fake news. So by and large, I think was good. I mean, there was fake news. And so um, after the first person received the first dose in the Oxford vaccine uh, trial, um, there was a lot of fake news saying they died. Well, it wasn't true. But actually, social media gets out very quickly. And so, of course, they had to pivot very quickly <laughs> to reassure the um, uh, other trialists and the families and the people involved to say this isn't true, this is fake news. And um, you know the patient, the volunteer was alive and well and doing just fine. But so I think countering fake news definitely, definitely was an issue. And I think AZ faced quite a lot of challenges on that front. I remember, uh, I think it was the second person to receive the Pfizer vaccine, maybe in the UK, was named William Shakespeare. <laughs> and I yeah. remember seeing sometime after he'd received the vaccine, an article saying he died. And I was reading the article and thinking, oh no, was this related to the vaccine? And no, he just died. And it, it yeah, was, he just died. He was an old guy. <laughs> yeah. It was a very strange article. Um, curious to know your thoughts, just because you mentioned, you know, the reaction to the blood clotting issue um, in the UK. Here in the United States, you know, we had the J&J &J vaccine and the CDC paused its use, the CDC and the FDA together paused its use. I wonder, you know, what your reaction was to seeing that. I mean, we still haven't cleared the AZ vaccine here in the US. I don't know if we ever will. Never will. No, I don't think so. So, I mean, there was, I mean, speaking from this side of the pond, it was interesting that AZ was paused for seven weeks and uh, J&J was paused for one week for the same uh, SUSA, so the same potential suspected adverse event. Um, there does seem to be, you know, there is a small but uh, real uh, clotting issue, I think, with that class of, of vaccines. Um, but they were treated somewhat differently. One thing that we have here, because everybody in the UK has an NHS number, is we do have access to population level um, background data on instance. So again, that was something I thought came out quite well in the media over here was the difference between uh, correlation and causation. And of course, once you're starting to vaccinate tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands, then ultimately millions of people, of course, people are going to end up with um, different um, diseases and symptoms, which are entirely unrelated to the vaccine. Um, but having that background instance data where you can actually go and say, well, you know, with this cohort of, you know, 65 year old diabetics with a BMI of X, you know, what would you expect? The, um, the background rates to be. Uh, and that's something that um, I think we managed quite well, but I think there's a way more that we could be doing um, to really continue to interrogate what, what those background in instances are by ethnicity, stage, demography, and so on. And so I also think that needs to be obviously done around, around the, the whole world. Um, I mean, I certainly saw the, the list of the key um, uh, indications the, the FDA has been focused on. Um, but, you know, again, the regulators should be able to 
largely agree what those side effects that they're most um, focused on and so that everybody is is monitoring and measuring the same things. Well, another one of the things that you had as part of your priorities uh, was global distribution of the vaccines. And one thing you mentioned is that with contracts like with Oxford, um, you actually put the importance of making the vaccine available internationally into the contract. Uh, tell us about just how you sort of sorted through that, what the response was from the companies and the, the universities that you were working with and what difference that ended up making uh, in terms of where you could exert some control there and where you couldn't. Um, so we could only exert control on, on basically vaccines which the UK had funded in some way. So the only two vaccines we could exert that level of control on was was uh, Oxford and Imperial. Uh, Imperial we down prioritised because we didn't think it was ready yet to uh, be part of the first wave of vaccines. So this was a self-amplifying um, uh, mRNA. Um, uh, but with Oxford, uh, it, I mean, this the, the the drive was just as strong from the academics as it was um, from the government, um, and the ultimate effect was um, twofold. First, uh, I think AZ did an astonishing job. So they uh, manufactured twenty three percent of vaccines given last year in 2021 and distributed when my latest data was in 170 countries. So basically more than double any other vaccine uh, distribution in terms of global reach. And because it was done as a non-profit, uh, uh, on a non-profit basis, it meant that you didn't have um, the per perverse incentive where, you, where companies would want to sell to low-risk individuals in rich countries because um, in order for, to secure the profits. Um, so they were then able to obviously uh, direct their vaccine to those who are most at risk around the world. So The Economist wrote a nice article saying, you know, they thought the AZ jab had probably saved more lives than any other precisely because of doing it on a, on a non-profit basis and therefore getting this global reach. So the, the one that I, I'm disappointed by was um, Janssen because the, the, or the J&J &J vaccine, because I think that's a great vaccine. And by having a single dose, it's much um, easier to administer uh, in, in, you know, hard to reach um, parts of the world, you know, northern Nigeria and some, you know, Bangladesh and different countries. And that's the one that I think has been least uh, uh, um, impressive in a way in terms of how it's really managed to get out um, because I think it's a good vaccine. Why do you think that is? Um, you know, they also pursued that not-for-profit not approach, but was there less of a drive to scale? Uh, I mean, you know, and it did have some setbacks, of course, with the, the clotting issue. Now it's been deprioritized, you know, or at least it's the mRNA vaccines have a priority recommendation from the CDC over the J&J &J vaccine here in the U.S., but why do you think that that vaccine hasn't had better reach? I, I just don't know. I mean, if I look at the stats, again, if I look at 2021, J&J's uh, re was responsible for 2% of, of global vaccine production. So it's tiny. I, I mean, I can't explain it because it's a good vaccine. And uh, yes, there are very, very small clotting issues. But compared with people not getting it at all, um, it's... And, and also the bit that I'm still don't really get in terms of the advice that's coming from um, uh, governments in terms of boosting is why there's such a focus to continue boosting with the identical vaccine. Because with the basics of immunology, you want to try and you broaden the um, immune response. So, so different uh, vaccines will generate somewhat different immune responses. And to try and both increase the breadth and depth and durability of those vaccines, I would have thought you'd want to use different formats. But that doesn't seem to have uh, translated into any recommendations yet. Uh, and of course, part of the, you know, the global distribution aspect of what you guys were doing involved participation in COVAX. Um, but what we have seen, of course, is that there's still not enough access to vaccines and a steady supply of vaccines and also the materials and everything you need to mount strong vaccination campaigns in low income countries. Uh, to what do you attribute the what some people have called the failure of, of COVAX, uh, or at least the situation where we're, we are now where not enough people have had access to even first doses? So I think there's different things. Um... 
the first of all, the rich countries clearly took the vaccines uh, first. So, you know, there was a time when the, that, you know, California had more vaccines than Africa. And but we were just the same. So it wasn't as if um, uh, any single country was worse than the other. But by and large, we had grossly inequitable vaccine distribution. And in a way, if if you're not getting to vaccinate some of these low income countries for 18 months after the pandemic starts, the people who are most at risk and most vulnerable in those low income countries will be dead before um, you get to vaccinate them. So I do think that uh, we need to work out how the global community can work more cooperatively so you can actually simultaneously vaccinate low income countries with high income countries, because it's pretty clear now, I think, that Omicron came uh, most likely from an immunocompromised individual um, in South Africa where the rampant, the, you know, they, that individual was probably um, infected for six months to, to get that level of, of um, continued mutations. And that is not helpful for anybody. It's certainly not helpful for South Africans, but not helpful for the world. And so the quicker we can actually get those people who are vulnerable vaccinated, the better. And so I don't know if you followed it, but the G7 last year, um, put together a 100-day mission um, to really s bring those countries together to work in partnership um, to prepare for future uh, pandemics. And that has a goal to, to basically sh share the global surveillance of potential um, pandemic um, agent, you know, pathogens with diagnostics that are in place, um, as well as prototype therapeutics and vaccines, so that you can, as soon as you've identified something, you can you can um, define what it is, get roll out the, the trials very very quickly, and start scaling up. Um, and I think the and that does require upfront funding um, before you know which any of these vaccines might work, and you know concerted efforts between governments and international organisations. So I think the fact that, you know, we, the world, were able to show that that you could go from sequence to vaccinations within less than a year uh, in 20, well, from in 2020, getting to that now to 100 days, I do think is doable, but we're going to have to really change our priorities and work out what that leadership is going to look like, because I'm not sure it's quite there yet. Yeah, well, and your third uh, sort of priority as, as part of this vaccines task force was to ensure that the UK is prepared potentially for future pandemics and to strengthen the capabilities in terms of a vaccine discovery, development, manufacturing. Where does that stand at this point? And how also do you approach the different vaccine platforms? You know, Wilmot was saying earlier, there's such a sort of reverence for mRNA vaccines but are those what we should be depending on? How much of a portfolio approach or in preparation should be taken going forward? Lots of questions there. So um, uh, in terms of what we've done, uh, we now have, I mean, it's still small beer compared with the States, but we have nine different sites around the UK that do everything from the uh, clinical trial scale up, bulk scale up and fill finish. So uh, and and we've got the flexibility of the manufacturing um, across the different sites so that uh, whether it's mRNA, adenoprotein based or whole virus, we've got that capability. So that's that's a good thing. Um, I mean, I think a portfolio approach and the flexibility is incredibly important. So in the context of you know South Africa with, with Wilmot, um, yes, I think mRNA is likely to be the first mover for these vaccines. Um, and so I think having that capability is going to be critical, but I do not think it's the panacea uh, for all vaccinations forever. Uh, as I said, I think we're going to need um, a range of different formats in order to generate a range of different broad immune responses. And again, the clinical data shows that heterologous boost, so mix and match, actually is does provide a durable and, and a broad immune response. And that's where I think we need to get to. And there's the other advantage of having a broader range of different vaccine formats, even if they take longer to scale and get up um, to you know, population level um, capacity, um, is we are 
still going to um, face some vaccine hesitancy. And so to the extent that some people are still hesitant about taking vaccines, being able to offer sort of old style vaccines, which are not the sort of hairy, scary mRNA sexy ones, um, I think will give comfort to people who are a bit more um, worried because those vaccine hesitant uh, individuals are still vaccinating their children. So they're happy to use tried and tested vaccinations, but they're not happy to use the the ones that they think have been rushed in terms of how they've been developed. Um, and so I think that's another argument, um, especially in low income countries where the populations may have less confidence in their government governments, um, which is, again, a key driver of willingness to take up vaccines. Um, and of course, mRNA still requires a pretty sophisticated, complex cold chain, and which, again, is not going to be suitable for many countries around the world. So we really need to think about improving format, improving um, delivery, and actually ultimately getting away from from needle based injections. I mean, that and cold chains. I mean, that is expensive and complex. We need to get to pills, patches, sprays, whatever it it, it is so that we can, you know, you can receive your vaccine in the post rather than having to go to a clinic where there's a freezer. Well, that would be <laughs> an interesting and very cool development. I think we are at the end of our time. I can't believe it's been so fast, but this has been fascinating. Thank you so much for, for taking this time with us. Thank you so much for having me. All right, I want to thank everybody. I mean, this has been a really fascinating discussion. I've gotten to watch all day and it's been just great. Dr. Rosenthal, an awesome moderation and a fantastic discussion. Uh, and Jill, I'll send it back over to you. Thank you, Meg. Great job. Hi, everyone. I'm Jill Wick, Director of Digital Strategy and Marketing here at Columbia University Irving Medical Center in New York City. Um, I want to say thank you to all of our amazing participants for joining us today, using all of your expertise and experience to address these key issues uh, from a very global perspective. So I don't know about everyone else, but I've pretty much been in a state of constant starstruck this whole week. Um, uh, so a huge thank you to the Grodman Family Foundation and Pfizer for making this event possible, to our external partners, the Rhodes Trust, the Atlantic Fellows, and the Schmidt Science Fellows. We sincerely appreciate all of your support. And a shout out to our internal partners, the Vaccine Safety and Confidence Building Working Group, also known as VaxSafe, the Institute for Social and Economic Research and Policy, ISERP, and everyone at Columbia University. So please be sure to join us again tomorrow at noon Eastern time for the last day of the 2022 Vaccine Symposium. Our experts will be looking ahead, uh, probably one of the most important things we all wanna know, um, at the what the future looks like in terms of next viruses, next vaccines over a five-year horizon. Thank you everyone and we'll see you tomorrow.